Y'all need to mute yourself, Kay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Here we go. Uh, can everybody see the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's talk turkey. The Eastern wild turkey. I won't even begin to pronounce the Latin, but I put it there for you to see. Uh, it's a true original native of America. Turkeys are North American natives at home here long before humans showed up almost 10 million years ago. It's the only breed of poultry native to the Western hemisphere and is the ancestor of the domesticated turkey that you'll be having, I'm sure, soon on your tables. Uh, the type found in Connecticut, the Milagris Galapavo Silvestris, uh, pardon me, uh, Homer, um, the, uh, is the most widely spread and it breeds throughout the Eastern United States and Eastern Canada. Uh, when the Spanish conquistadors took the birds back to Spain, Mediterranean traders from Turkey who typically traded guinea hens acquired some of these birds and started raising them and trading them with other countries. Consequently, people thought the birds came from Turkey and started calling them turkeys. The English then started buying and raising the birds and brought some to the New World, but the settlers at Plymouth and Jamestown were very shocked to discover that there were tens of thousands of these wild birds roaming the woods and they started hunting them. Uh, they also started cutting down the trees, which meant that some of the turkey's best habitat would be disappearing. Turkeys are birds of woods and open spaces. Native Americans who burned forest plots to create openings in the woodland created great turkey habitat. They're, they like to browse on plants. Wild turkeys were an important resource for many Native American peoples, not just for their meat and eggs, but also for their feathers, bones, and spurs, which were used to make clothing, spoons, musical instruments, arrow tips, and much more. Estimates again put the population of wild turkeys before Columbus arrived here at over 10 million, although no one was counting. Around 1600, uh, when the, um, the settlers came here, the populations began to dwindle. If you have spent any time around turkey hunting, you have probably heard of turkey callers. This is a wing bone caller. They are turkey calls that are made from the actual bones found in a wild turkey's wing. Historians and archaeologists say that wing bone turkey calls date back perhaps 6,500 years. Native Americans made these yelper calls from the three bones found in the wing of a turkey, the radius, which is the smallest bone, the ulna, and the humerus, the biggest bone. There were an estimated, again, 10 million turkeys when we came here, uh, but the colonists completely changed all that. They started cutting down the forest to clear areas for farms to use for building. They send some of the wood uh, back to England for furniture and masts on ships. Uh, so quickly, uh, the forests in Connecticut, which were over 90% forested when the colonists came here, dwindled to 30%. Turkeys needing woodland habitat retreated to the few pockets of forest that were left in the state. The settlers followed them into the woods and shot them for food. Uh, New England hunters, farmers, lumbermen, and massive development had driven the species to near extinction. By 1813, they were totally gone from the state of Connecticut. By 1842, Vermont saw its last tur turkey, and they disappeared from Massachusetts in 1851 and New Hampshire in 1854. Again, the columnists, uh, they did a lot of things. They had to subsist. They had to farm, so they did clear trees and uh, that did decimate a lot of our wildlife populations, uh, including native wolves, uh, black bear, um, moose, um, the cougar. Uh, but at the time it was necessary for their subsistence. Now this is a story I have to tell you. When I was a kid, my dad made me read two hours, made us read two hours a day in the summer. And he ordered these landmark books, which were basically history books fictionalized uh, in a sense where kids could read them. Uh, one of my favorites was The Swamp Fox of the Revolution. And I can tell you, I reenacted The Swamp Fox many times on my horse, even though there weren't swamps in the part of Texas where I grew up. Uh, turkeys played a minor role during the Revolutionary War because of the guerrilla tactics of a South Carolinian officer known as the Swamp Fox. Francis Marion spent the war showing the British just how uncomfortable he could make their time 
in the colonies with nothing but a few dozen rifles and a refusal to fight fair. Like many leaders of the revolution, Marion spent time as a young man fighting in the French and Indian Wars, and it taught him some important lessons. Uh, the Cherokee didn't fight in the traditional manner. When facing an overwhelming force, they used the landscape to initiate ambushes and sniper harassment. With the start of the war in 1776, Marion was commissioned as a captain and he led his troops to several, several victories over the British. Eventually, he decided to use some of these Native American tactics and he raised a small force of about 50 experienced soldiers and led them in a series of Cherokee style ambushes on the British. Often, the signal to open fire would be given by Marion using three yelps on a wing bone turkey call. He also used it to let people know where he was. Uh, he, wore it, he wore it on a lanyard around his neck. So this, uh, this story was something I didn't really realize until I started uh, looking into turkeys, but I was very happy to know that one of my uh, childhood uh, heroes, not, I don't know whether it was hero, but somebody I enjoyed reading about was also had to do it, the wild turkeys. And then that brings us to Ben Franklin and turkeys. Now, if you've heard my bald eagle talk, you know about Ben Franklin and the turkeys. Uh, the wild turkey got a reputational boost uh, by one of our founding fathers, even though by the time of his proposal, proposal, the number of wild turkeys and bald eagles were in devastating declines. Uh, as you know, he was an erudite, sophisticated diplomat who was a genius, an inventor, a writer, an author, and, but when it came down to it, a very practical man. There are reports that Franklin proposed the turkey as a national symbol, and that began to circulate in American newspapers, but it actually was untrue. Um, when he, after the symbol had been adopted, the bald eagle, he was in the order of Cincinnatus and they wanted a symbol for their club. And so he proposed the turkey and he wrote a letter to his daughter and extolled the virtues of the gobbler. Uh, in doing so, he was not only delivering a critique of the great seal, but the new ed, uh, medal that was issued, I'm sorry, issued by Cincinnatus. What he said to his daughter was, for my own part, I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen as a representative of this country. It was a bird of bad moral character that does not get his living honestly because it steals food from the fishing hawk and is too lazy to fish for himself. Um, so he was very much, he said, the turkey is in comparison a much more respectable bird and with all a true original Native America. He is besides, though a little vain and silly, a bird of courage and would not hesitate to attack a grenadier of the British guards. And to go further, actually when the Continental Congress had asked Franklin, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams to come up with a seal for the country, they each came up with very convoluted biblical and mythological images that included Moses, Pharaoh, the children of Israel and Hercules all much too sophisticated and unwieldy for a seal. So they finally left it up to Charles Thompson, who was the only secretary the Continental Congress ever had, and he's the one who came up with the bald eagle. We think that the story got popularized again in this night when this 1962 New Yorker cover came out, just showing what it would look like if we had the eagle for our symbol. And uh, we think that's how the story got into schools and spread so much. For many years, the only place you could find something called wild turkey in New England was on a liquor store shelf. And as with the success of the return of America's symbol, the bald eagle, the wild turkey has returned in droves. I'm sure if you live here in Connecticut, you see them all over the place. Uh, Connecticut land left alone naturally returns to forest. So when the farmers stop farming, either going out mid to the Midwest to farm or to take city jobs, the landscape did begin to revert to forest. Today we are over 65% forested. Uh, we had a rehabilitation of turkeys in 1975. DEP uh, biologists imported a flock of 25 turkeys from New York and took them to the 6,000 acre Great Mountain Forest in Norfolk. As the flock prospered and grew, the DEP captured some of its members and moved them to other spots in the state. Other of those turkeys migrated into Connecticut from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New York. By the early 1990s, they were considered fully restored to the state. Hunters now harvest 1,500 to 2,000 birds a year, 
and the Connecticut population is estimated at over 40,000 birds. Today, it is estimated that over 7 million wild turkeys exist in the United States. And of course, I've told you how random wildlife is, and it always amazes me how they can estimate, but they, they figure they get in a pretty good uh, deal. An abundance or rafter of gobblers. A group of uh, turkeys are called uh, a rafter. As you can see, they can just really take over areas. Uh, it's one of the most widely distributed game animals in North America, and they can be hunted in every state except Alaska. Again, as I said, they, they are estimated to be upwards of 7 million, made of five different wild turkey species. Each subspecies looks, sounds, and acts a bit differently. Here they are. As you can see, the oscillated turkey on the top left is mostly in Mexico. Uh, and then the eastern wild turkey, which is the one that overspreads most of the U.S., is the largest and most widespread. It occurs in every state east of the Mississippi River and along, along the length of the river's western side, as well as eastern portions of several plain states in Texas. The population of the eastern wild turkey is estimated to be about 5.3 million. There are a few transplant populations in Washington, Montana, and California. They're the heaviest of the turkey subspecies. Their weights regularly exceed 25 pounds. They also have the longest beards, which is a tuft, those tufts of uh, hair uh, in front. Uh, and they also have the loudest gobble, but they do compete with the Osceola turkey, which is in Florida, for the longest spurs on their, their feet and the darkest feathers. Their tail, tail fans are copper to bronze in color, and I always love finding these feathers. I just sent two of the striped feathers out to my little cowboy great nephews in Oklahoma to put on their cowboy hats. Uh, the eastern wild turkey strong deep-throated gobbles are symbolic of the wild turkey. Another turkey, the Miriam's turkey, is scattered across parts of Arizona and New Mexico through the mountain states uh, to Nebraska, the Dakotas, and along the Washington, Oregon, and Idaho borders. It's best distinguished by the light buff to white tail band and coverts. Um, it's, uh, while similar to the Rio, which is also in Western Texas, its gobble is even higher pitched and softer. They're as widely distributed as the Eastern wild turkey, uh, but their overall pop population is significantly lower. Of all the turkey subspecies, the Merriams have the quietest gobble the shortest beards, the shortest spurs, and the lightest colored fans. Uh, I wonder if they have a, a complex. Uh, they have hybridized with some Eastern turkeys and that's altered some of the flocks in the Great Plains. Uh, the Osceola turkey again is only found in Florida. Their population is around 90,000 birds. So you have a really pretty good chance of seeing them. As you can see, they're very iridescent and, and uh, gorgeous. What they lack in weight and beard length they make up for in spurs. Uh, they have the longest spurs of any turkey species. The Rio Grande turkey uh, range spans from Kansas south through Texas and into northeastern Mexico. Uh, there are even some in Hawaii. I'm not sure how they got there. I know they didn't fly there. But anyway, they're the best distinguished by their tan tips of their tail feathers and tail coverts. Uh, their gobble also is different from the eastern and Osceola. It's very high pitched and warbly. Uh, the Gould's turkey species, um, which I see I didn't put on there. Where is it? I'm sorry. Uh, there is one called the Gould's turkey, and it's in Arizona, New Mexico, and Central America. They have the longest legs and largest feet of all the turkey subspecies. Um, sorry, I didn't put it there. <laughs> so on. Uh, so here's the distribution you can see. So the, the dark blue is the eastern subspecies. So you can see it's overspread just past the Mississippi kind of stops when it gets to uh, Colorado, Nebraska. Um, and then uh, the orange uh, is the Osceola. Uh, the Goulds is a subspecies, which there's very, very few of them. Uh, the red would be the Miriam. Uh, so you can see they're spread across, but there are some definite areas where they're, they are less uh, populated. Here's the different ones. Here's the wild turkey and the range again. You can see the oscillated turkey. So turkeys are very beautiful. Even the eastern wild turkey of the sun shining on it, it's, it's uh, very gorgeous. Um, so the turkeys, as I said, are on the rebound. Uh, in the early 19 turkeys, they were on the brink of extinction with only about 200,000 left in the country. 
but through conservation efforts over the past century with funds derived from the Pittman at Robertson Act. And that puts a tax on sporting arms and ammunition and helps pay for wildlife rest restoration. Uh, all this and these other acts, the Federal Wildlife Restoration Program uh, and, and many farms that failed, all of these things help the forest come back and reclaim some of the habitat that is uh, necessary for the wild turkey. Uh, this is a turkey that was in my woods. Uh, they're overspreading the fields and pastures nearby now. Uh, if you see them along roads a lot, they like to, to eat salt. A lot of animals do too, Ra raccoons do as well. They use deciduous mixed upland and riparian woodlands. Grasslands and woodlands uh, edges are important for their nesting and raising their broods. Uh, what do they eat? No matter where they are found or what subspecies they are, wild turkeys eat basically the same types of foods, allowing, of course, for regional availability. Regardless, though, they're opportunistic feeders, meaning they'll eat darn near anything they can fit down their throats. They eat acorns, berries, dogwoods, juniper, wild grapes, and a variety of available plant matter, such as grasses that produce large heads of seeds. They also will eat wasted grain out in agricultural areas. Adult turkeys that eat about approximately 90% plant matter and 10% insects, while the poults, which are their baby turkeys, eat a diet mainly of insects, and I'm told they eat it like it's candy. Uh, Again, uh, they are a little bit of generalists. They will eat what's available, uh, you know, uh, and also they will eat your bird seed, which I'm sure if you have it out now against my uh, warnings that you shouldn't until the bears go in, uh, they will eat your bird seed. On the bottom right, you see the stomach contents of a necropsy garb gobbler. Uh, there's a lot of acorns on the left. Again, acorns are called mast, and that's really one of the top uh, feeds for most animals here in New England in the fall. Uh, then you can see there's some berries, some grubs, some green grass shoots, and I think there's a few number four shot pellets there. So again, uh, uh, shot pellets, any kind of lead uh, ammunition can poison animals, so we do encourage people to please change to uh, copper or whatever other uh, materials are available. Let's talk turkey. Uh, when you want to identify what animals have been by, uh, the scat or their poop or their droppings is very important with turkeys. You can tell their sex and age. The male droppings are J-shaped. The female droppings are spiral shaped. And the larger the diameter, the older the bird, which is true also with bears and some other animals. Uh, young turkeys, as I said, poults, they'll scarf down insects like candy. Uh, they may look off kilter, tilting their heads. Uh, and staring at the sky, yet they're very fast. Turkeys can run 25 miles per hour on foot and fly up to 50 miles per hour. One of the things I've noticed this summer, more than any other summer, there have been quite a bit of groups of um, two hens that are raising their poults together. And uh, I've seen that they do this because, say, if they each had, they can have upwards of nine to 10 poults. So that's a gang of like 20. But with the two hens, they can help protect the, the poults better. So when they go across a road, which is quite a sight, they'll be going across the road and one hen will stay on the side they're crossing from and the other hen will be on the other side and they'll both wait until all the little poults have gotten across. The other thing I noticed with a gang of turkeys or a rafter of turkeys, bears are afraid of them, which cracks me up. I have bears in my yard a lot, like every day. And you know, more than once, no matter whether it's a male, big male bear or a sow or, or a yearling, I'll watch the bear and say it's out there eating my mulberries or something. And it keeps looking up, looking up, which bears tend to do anyway during a minute, but this is a lot. And I'm looking around, I don't hear anything, I don't see anything. And I can tell you 10 to 20 times this summer, the bears, tear off for the woods and then around the corner comes all these turkeys. It's like the funniest thing you've ever seen. So anyway, uh, the wild turkey is one of only two birds native to North America that has been regularly domesticated. The other is the Muscovy duck. Uh, the turkeys are sophisticated talkers with separate alarm calls for ground predator and aerial predator. They can live from three to five years in the wild. One was recorded as 13. Again, they can lose their lives they, by getting hit by cars, by being hunted. Uh, you know, wild animals have a lot of uh, things that can go wrong. 
Uh, here they are flying. As I said, they can go up to 25 miles an hour. Uh, the wild turkey's head changes colors when it's scared or excited, and the male's head uh, colors do change during breeding season. Wild turkeys are covered with dark feathers, and see how it helps them. It really camouflages them uh, and helps them blend in with their forest home. Wild turkeys have excellent eyesight and a few other well-developed senses. They're extremely tactile sensitive because of their excellent eyesight. When I see a wild turkey, I always look at its eyes. It always sees me first, even if I'm behind a window, because they have such incredible eyesight. No sooner do you see a turkey approaching than it's gone. And as trees lose their leaves in the fall, the problem is exaggerated. Clear lines of sight give turkeys an advantage which in a sense, I like this because I guess that makes hunting really hunting. Uh, the retinas in the turkey eyes have seven different types of photoreceptors. They can detect movement at great distances, but there's one particular type of color sensitive cone cell that gives turkeys almost super vision. These are sensitive ultraviolet light, so they can see things that we cannot. Their sensitivity to UV light puts humans at a disadvantage. Even when motionless, we give ourselves away because our clothing can make a stationary watcher impossible to miss. Laundry detergents that whiten and brighten clothing leave behind a UV residue. And the more often items are washed with these detergents, the more UD, UV residue they retain. So the turkeys can actually see this. Um, they do not have external ear structures to assist with hearing. They have small holes in their heads located behind their eyes. Even so, they have a keen sense of hearing and can pinpoint sounds from a mile away. They're highly sensitive to touch in areas such as their beak and feet. This helps them in obtaining and maneuvering food. But their sense of taste and smell are underdeveloped. And no, I don't think they have COVID, thank goodness. But um, the turkey's wingspan is four to five and a half feet. It has 5,500 feathers, including 18 tail feathers. And these uh, these feathers, they do uh, shed and they will grow again. Their beard just keeps growing though. Uh, these are tracks of a tom turkey. They're six to seven inches long. Adult hen tracks are 4.5 to five inches long. And here's some tracks I saw at our last snow on my road. And uh, the turkey and the tire tracks on the left and turkey and squirrel tracks on the right. So you can kind of see just how big those turkey feet are. So here are some of the parts of the turkey. Uh, you know, they, um, we know they're obviously their foot. You can see that beard. It can be three to four inches on a jake is what, it, what a young tom turkey is called. Seven to nine inches on a two-year-old and up to 10 inches or longer on three-year-old gobbler. Um, the snood is that thing that hangs down from their nose. Uh, it's mostly on a gobbler, but it doesn't seem to have any function, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Uh, again, there's no flap on their ear opening. The spurs can be pretty lethal. Uh, I've read stories of hunters being spurred uh, by the birds. So uh, they're pretty, pretty well bit cre creature, uh, you know, to protect themselves pretty well. They're on, they're, most of the, their predators can be bobcat. Uh, the young colts can be taken by owls or eagles. Uh, coyotes might prey on, on turkey uh, out west, of course, uh, wolves and uh, and cougars, uh, and then of course humans in car strikes. Male wild turkeys are called toms or gobblers. Gobblers because of the noise they make, which I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, hens don't gobble, they make a clicking noise. The tom turkeys port that beard, uh, which consists of a tuft of black filamentous feathers that protrude from their breasts. Um, Eastern wild turkeys, again, are very large birds. Uh, they can stand up to 2.5 feet tall with an average weight of 18 to 25 pounds and a length of 48 inches. They're very dark. Their feathers are iridescent. Uh, their spurs can be up to 1.5 inches in length on their legs. And the hair beard can go to 12 inches. Uh, their bodies are dark black brown, as I said, that helps them camouflage. During breeding season, their, their heads will turn red, blue, and white. And then they have that distinctive gobble uh, during this time to attract females. Um, during the spring, male wild tur turkeys' uh, physical appearance does change. Again, as I said, their head color changes. Uh, I'm going to let you hear some of their noises now. Here's their gobble. Quiet. 
quite a racket, isn't it? So here's what is called clacking. They're quite the noisy birds, and, and uh, this is noises they make when they start to fly up. And this uh, this key key roo should be roo not run is is uh, it's kind of a alarm signal from young uh, poults but also from the hens. So you see these birds like owls can make many many noises that you might not realize are. Oh, hey. That wasn't supposed to start. I was supposed to be able to go. <laughs> Sorry, I was supposed to be going to the next slide. It didn't go. Help. <laughs> anyway, so here you can see a, a turkey when it's uh, in its uh, red phase. They're just very, very beautiful. Uh, here's those sharp pointed spikes. You can see they're very you know, sharp and can, can be very lethal to something attacking a turkey. Uh, so with the males, it's all about the strut. Gobblers need strutting areas. A Tom will strut most anywhere when he's in the mood, but he'd much rather be in the open where the ladies can see him and he can see predators. That could be in food plotted areas or just logging rolls. Uh, all things in fairly good supply on most uh, properties. He can often be seen puffed up, tail feathers fanned out, and his wings dragging on the ground. This display is called strutting, and the purpose of it is to attract the hens for breeding. Our turkeys breed in the spring. The body feathers on the back and breast raise simultaneously. You can see on the top, on the left, where they're raised up, making the gobbler appear larger. How they do that? Think of it kind of as controlled goosebumps, but they're turkey bumps. They small, have small muscles that are located at the base of each feather, and that enables the bird to move its feathers. These muscles are connected to other very small muscles within the skin. When strutting, the turkey contracts the muscles that control the feather position, causing these feathers to stand erect. The same applies for a group of muscles that are located at the base of the tail and in the wing. The head, neck, and snood, which is that long red thing hanging down, and caruncles are naked skin. The caruncles are the bumpy part of the turkey. The head's crown or skull cap is typically pure white when the turkey is strutting. It's often the first thing a hunter notices as a strutter approaches. The face, neck, and caruncles may range from blue to bright red flesh to tone or white, and they change colors in response to the bird's mood. How they do that? They're pretty talented birds. Uh, they have the capacity to contract and relax small blood vessels in the head and neck skin causing color changes. So pretty, pheno pretty phenomenal. Um, female wild turkeys, of course, are called hens. This is true of, you know, ducks and a lot, a lot of uh, bird species. Uh, they're much smaller than the toms. They weigh 9 to 12 pounds. They have rusty body color and a blue-gray head. Some of the hens will have beards. Uh, again, they're lighter in color uh, and uh, they generally make a yelp or clucking noise. The young males are called Jake. It's an immature male bird. Uh, generally, they define a Jake turkey as a one-year-old bird. A young, and, uh, they can also sometimes be confused with hens in the field. Again, the strutting. Sometimes hens do strut. I don't know if, if they get confused or they're just feeling good. It's a sunny day. So on the top, you have strutting hens on the bottom left, the male. And again, the strutting is associated with breeding season when gobblers defend their status and show off their plumage to attract hens. I guess the best strutter gets, gets the hens more frequently. Uh, but frankly, toms strut their stuff a lot. <laughs> they'll, they'll do it year round sometimes, even when hens aren't present. Uh, the toms tend to hang around together uh, when it's not mating season and the hens will hang around together. Uh, I guess the males just like airing it out. Uh, the display it has additional implications in other circumstances, such as a show of dominance among males uh, outside of breeding season and when winter flocks reconnect and try to establish their pecking order. 
they they strut anywhere they the notion strikes but there are two attributes common to many sites they like good sunlight and enough open air for them to be seen and to spot danger and see when the hens are approaching and they like to have a place with good acoustics so the gobbles can be heard from a long distance uh, so these are called strut zones so that's <laughs> pretty funny but turkeys are really pretty fun to watch i have to say you know you you're very lucky uh, to get to see them and just get to watch, uh, watch them. They also have a, when they're strutting, the, the um, males have an ability to spit and drum. Uh, it adds subtle sounds and drama to their courtship. It starts with a couple of quick steps and it will lift its front leg and open its beak slightly and emit a brief but forceful poof or tick sound. Their body feathers audibly shudder uh, just remember those tiny muscles I told you about, and the bird will emit a low-pitched drumming sound that begins low and increases in tone and volume at the end. So they have quite the noises, these turkeys. Uh, a turkey hen makes a ground nest uh, with her beak to camouflage her herself and her eggs, but they are on the ground, so they are uh, you know, vulnerable to predators. She sits on them for 26 days of incubation. But she does try to lay them near water uh, so that she can run out and get some water and food sources. Uh, so she prefers a wooded hideaway, a dry place, but again, close to water, but an area that allows her to survey her surroundings as she sits on the eggs because only she's there when the eggs are laid. Uh, again, breeding season here starts in late March, early April, and that's when the to toms will strut their stuff. And the females lay four to 17 eggs. The reason for this is true of a lot of um, animal species. They lay a lot more eggs that are, than are gonna survive because the survival rate is less than 50% for turkeys. Um, they'll feed their chicks after they hatch only for a few days. Moms, wouldn't you like that? Then the young turkeys quickly learn to fend for themselves uh, as part of a mother-child flocks that can include dozens of animals as I told you. Uh, again, males take no role uh, in care of young turkeys. Um, here's some uh, hen yelps. These are excited hen yelps. Doesn't sound too excited to me. Sounds a little uh, uh, non close, but anyway, here's their cluck and their purr. sound worried to me the hens now here's what they'll this is tree calling so turkeys roost up in trees or when there's danger almost like bear cubs going up a tree they'll go to trees and they can fly they can't fly for long distances but they can fly enough to get themselves in trees so here's how they'll summon eat. oh wait did i get that oh yeah there it is <laughs> To me, that's a rather calm enticement too. Okay, so here I told you most of this, but again, they can have four to 17 eggs. Generally, they have one brood a year, but if they lost it really early, they would have the ability to have another brood. Uh, the, the eggs can be up to 1.9 inches in width and 2.7 inches in length. Uh, incubation period varies. Uh, one day, they, they nest like uh, and again, they're pale yellowish tan, uh, and uh, the, the poults are pretty well developed. Uh, when they hatch, the problem is they do get taken out by different predators. They get run over. You can imagine if you have like 12 uh, poults crossing a road, like it's likely one might get hit, particularly in a highly fragmented state like Connecticut. So here they are, they're pretty cute. And there they are, and you'll see them in, as in the bottom right, you'll just see them uh, going around that like that forever. And then they keep growing and growing and every single day you count and hope there's the original nine, but then it'll go to seven and then you hope. But now that I've seen this year with the two hens, they seem to last better. Uh, the DEP does have a turkey count. They like people to go onto the DEP website and in the summer, uh, you can print out these sheets and they, they would like you to record when you see 
a turkey uh, with her new poults and count them and then they just and as the dates go on you keep putting the numbers there this is like a, a farmer citizen science and i encourage you to do it it's kind of cool and then they'll get send you the results at the end uh, so again here you see even in the winter they get once they move among the trees even though they're dark they can pretty well uh, camouflage and they are very very beautiful critters uh, uh, they do poop a lot uh, but they're all over the place. These are all around my area and uh, they're obviously eating here. And, uh, but they've been causing a lot of trouble lately, you know, uh, because development is happening in so many places. A lot of our animals are displaced. Some are bring, being attracted to yards by bird seed. So there was a case of New Jersey with this uh, rafter of turkeys kept chasing this mailman whenever he came around a certain house, but apparently that house had a lot of food sources outside. Uh, when I was in Scotland uh, in 2019 and my security camera buzzed and so I looked on my phone and there was a turkey looking into the his reflection on my door of my brand new car. I don't have a garage and then it started pecking and so I'm like what? So I texted my neighbor can you go down and chase that turkey away <laughs> and she went and chased it away and of course it came right back so so they, they can be a little mean sometimes. Uh, and then my last question for you is, why did the turkey cross the road? <laughs> this was on my road and I was happy to get that. So uh, anyway, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, let's all find ourselves again. I'll try to find myself and uh, be happy to answer any questions. I got a question. Okay. The os oscillating turkey or oscillator. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a peacock. Almost. I know they have been mistaken for peacocks. Uh, can you? Can you? Uh, everybody want to come back on so I can see you? I don't know. How can you see things. us? Uh, I can't see anybody but myself. Let's see. I see names. Uh, yeah. I don't see anything. It says end of slideshow. Click to exit. Yeah, I see Warren now. He's there. Have you done that? Click to exit. I haven't found the chat though. Uh, Erica, you'll have to read any chat questions because I don't see it. The chat where I, oh, I can't get. My my screen says end of slideshow. Click to exit. Oh, I don't know whether that's exit the whole thing or not. Um, well, I can't see anything but that anymore. Uh, if you go down to share screen, and then it'll give you something. It says you can uh, go sure. back mm -hmm. on again. I just discovered it. The uh, middle. It's green on ours. Yeah, right? share it's content. Up. All right, I and did go that. To, uh, share screen, tap that, and then you'll be able to come back. David, I'm glad you're here to show us how to drive this thing. <laughs> I don't know much. Uh oh, now I just lost. Now I don't know what happened. Um, Erica still has her screen shared, uh -oh. which needs to. There we go. That's no, me. Okay, there. All right, well, I, I can't see the chat. Oh, here's the chat box. Okay. No one had any questions. Wait a minute. Now it says host disabled candy screen sharing. I see you, David. I see Warren. I see Pam and Kay. You do? I don't see you. And I see Francis. Hi, Francis. Oh, he's got the name of Swamp Fox. <laughs> uh huh. Any other questions? Oh. Any well, we can we can only see the DM Hunt library screen. I did I did also mean to tell you it's illegal for farmers to let you know domesticated turkeys out, but uh, you know I guess I can't help it. I mean we have so many people's dogs running loose here in my town. I just can't even imagine why there's so many dogs. Yay! Running. Yay. <laughs> also, in places where the wild pigs are going crazy, like Texas. Uh, a lot of a lot of young turkey poults are getting eaten by the wild pigs, and they also do tear up the the ground. You know, a lot of the ground where the turkeys would be eating from. There she is. Hello, Margaret Chapman. Anybody have any questions? Get I only really see this. I don't know where your uh, camera is. They just get the scene. I'm sure most of you have most of you have tur groups of turkeys in your yards, right? Yeah, yeah. Is well, it bad? In the cabinet, but mm -hmm. is it good or bad to feed them to give them bird seed? 
you know, in the winter, we say bird seed's fine, you know, uh, it's bad to give like animals like deer and stuff, uh, you know, the deer, deer, oh, you know, deer. Deer. You know, <laughs> corn or, or whatever, but, you know, the bird seed, we haven't found any, any sense that it hurts the turkey. Well, um, you know, we do ask people to not have bird seed in like March till mid-November, even though our bears are not hibernating yes. later now because of the lack of weather. Uh, but most of the cows that are going to have cubs in January okay. have already uh, <coughs> started hibernating. But um, I don't know that. A lot of times when we have the mild winters, because you know bears aren't complete hibernators, they go in a sense of torpor, a state of torpor. So they'll come out, you know, even during the winter. But be pretty mm -hmm. much says, you know, keep your bird seed. Uh, you know, save your money until November, mid middle of November. Probably uh, now a good earmark is probably Thanksgiving, I would say. That's so the bears don't get it? Is that the idea? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, if you don't have bears in your yard and they're not bothering you. you know, <laughs> we wish. We live on great mountain forests. So. Yeah, right. If a, bear, <laughs> if a bear shows up, you need to bring it in, you know, for two weeks at least. Uh, well, the way we've been doing seed is just scattering black sunflower seed on the ground. Yeah, and I, I have a flock of 30 turkeys that comes every day and they expect oh. it. They get annoyed if it's not there. That's right. They're going to come peck on your windows and ask for your cranberry juice. They do. They come up to the windows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do. We don't have that in Texas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you have bobcats on the roofs there. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. On my fence. <laughs> And the other day, I had a raccoons and, a, and her four babies walk across my driveway. Yeah. So you know what's happening? A lot of a uh, lot of animals are becoming ex-urban because uh, our you know lands are becoming fragmented by road and and development. And so uh, we have a lot of bobcats that are urban now because. Oh wait a minute! Wait a second! <laughs> oh. <laughs> She got hers and he got his. Oh, no. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of predators are looking okay. at a lot of, a lot of animals that eat garbage yeah. are, are their prey. No, so the baby's not up to <laughs> There we go. We got the we got the cat the cats here. They're not fair. <laughs> well, I hope everybody stays safe and well during the holiday. And um, nice. Well, thank you very day. much. I really appreciate thank it. You. Okay. Yeah, it was really interesting. They're really what beautiful. Are you, what are you heading south? I like talking. I'm not coming. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm in one of the safest states, so I don't think it's good to go to one of the more dangerous places right now. Uh, to get there is gonna would be a problem. So I probably am not coming this Christmas. So yeah. Well, we'll Jenny, talk I want to thank you so much for uh, right. this you. presentation. It was fascinating. I learned so much about mm -hmm. wild turkeys. And, and I feel great that they uh, there's a lot of them in Connecticut. Do we have so. somebody, something else on tap for the Hunt Library or not? I can't remember. Uh, in regards to what? Me talking. I got to give you my list. And yeah. See. Oh, definitely. We were going to do eagles in March, right? Oh, great. Okay. I didn't know. Yeah. I done them I them. Yeah. And I got a few other topics I'll run by you. Oh, good. That sounds okay. good. We're all at home. Great. We might as well listen, right? That's <laughs> right. Well. All right. Learn a lot. Thank oh, yeah. you so much. All right, Thanks, Jenny. All right. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, you take very care. Much. Be in touch. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hit leave. Okay. Leave me again.